Thank you so much for that introduction, Aaron, Anisha. It's been, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's really inspiring to see a lot of faces, um, very diverse, a very diverse crowd. I'm always really excited to come and talk to students, to other faculty about the work they're doing, uh, and always being really curious about what is, what is that that interests you as a, as a designer. Um, I have, I would like to share today um, a couple of things, yes, about the work that I do, but I wanted to frame this as a journey. This talk is a journey, and a journey of what I experienced as a designer, having all these questions and going through different moments, um, decision-making moments in my career, and finding those things that I think very strongly design should be doing. Um, and when Anisha reached out and say, we'd like you to come and share some of the things you're doing at Borderless, she also framed the invitation, make me, making me think or react to this idea of, of crisis. How do designers respond to this idea of crisis? And working in different fronts of action, both through my teaching practice, through my um, urban design studio, planning projects. I work with a lot of communities that are in constant crisis. And it's a crisis that translates into frustration, the frustration of being underserved, underlooked, um, and not having access to a lot of the resources that in many cases we are privileged to have access to. So this idea of, of crisis, um, I start to think in how to frame it around the work that I do. I think we have a crisis of accessibility. And I'll go through back to this um, in several points during the, during the different projects that I'm gonna talk about. But I want you to take a look to this. Um, this is my primary group of stakeholders. I basically work for them. When I think about the future, this is the generation that I feel as a designer I'm serving. And that thought has from, comes from this idea of me reflecting on how I've been learning this capacity I have as a designer to make an impact in my built environment, in my communities, in my cities. And so Jane Jacobs told us that only when uh, communities are part of their processes is that when they become, they, they thrive and they become part of uh, the, that ownership, that shared ownership that makes us feel the sense of belonging. So I come from public service. I started my career very, um, at the start of my career, I, I went to work for government as a young architect, um, had the opportunity to um, work for the city of Chihuahua in a very young agency, planning agency. Um, and in Mexico, uh, the practice of planning is relatively young. We didn't start until the 70s. So this idea of thinking about the public and thinking about public service became very early in my career part of my DNA. Um, and it followed me through the different moments of my career. Um, it also became part of my language. And this idea of thinking what our responsibility is, no matter from what discipline we are, what our responsibility is towards our communities, towards uh, the places that we have the opportunity to live, and the places that we um, have the opportunity to have access to wonderful resources. Um, so I'm from a, a city and state called Chihuahua. If you were familiar with its location, it's in the northern part of Mexico City. And I've been based in Chicago since 2011. Uh, the joke in my home is I'm in between Chai Towns so Chihuahua and Chicago, so I can't move from Chicago anymore because that joke wouldn't make any sense. Um, but um, I started this idea of borderless um, before I moved to Chicago, and the idea behind it is 
how not only this um, very strong feeling I had about the, the physical barriers that a territory uh, prescribes for us does, don't really make sense. So being a native from a border region where I had a very strong relationship and dynamic and lifestyle that I was linked to the United States, to the southern states of the United States, how that notion of this fluid boundaries or invented boundaries wouldn't, would apply as well to other things, such as the idea of scale. We are told that they're interior designers and architects, but we actually navigate between those scales. We are told we could be architects or urban designers or urban planners. The reality is that all of those scales are very interconnected and we need to understand all of them to make connections, to think about networks, to think about reciprocity, and to think how one aspect of design influences the others. Uh, cross geographies. So we can think this in a very global scale, but also I, I live in, I've been living in a city that is called the city of neighborhoods. And it feels sometimes that I, live, that I transport myself um, within different cities. The problems and the impact that segregation um, has created in cities like Chicago are um, very visible. And when I talk about geographies, it's not this abstract concept about cartographies that are span territories. It, it becomes um, an aspect to reflect within our cities, within our own city. And cultures, of course, because I'm in between this uh, Mexican identity that I feel very proud and connected, but also I'm learning that there are other values that they're not better, they're just different, and they represent um, multiple cultures that I get exposed to every day. So how do we navigate a world like that? How do we navigate in our cities as designers all these um, values and, and distinct identities? And I decided to think, what are the two things that I can do through borderless as a, as a practice and as a philosophy? So the first one is connecting communities to design processes. We are trained, or I was trained in a way where I am told I'm the expert, and I come to the table to provide a direction. I see myself more like as a translator. I listen, or I've learned, I'm still learning how to listen, and I take this um, skill set that I have and use it to translate, not my vision, the vision that those who are living in the spaces that I'm aiming to design for. And cultivate, the second one is cultivating collaborative design agency. And this idea of agency is very powerful. It means we can make a change. We have at the, at the tip of our fingers this capacity. It's a very exciting time to be a designer. There's just so much access to resources, to tools, to technology. But there's still other aspects that are analog and important to keep thinking and cultivating as part of our skill set. Um, but also this idea of collaboration. I'm always super interested in creating collaborative projects or working in collaborative projects, not only because they're much, they're richer by this exchange of experiences and perspectives, but also because this is how we build relationships. This is how we build relationships with our colleagues, with our friends, with the communities that we're working for. Um, so I've been really fortunate um, started Borderless in 2016, um, and I've been really fortunate to be part of teams that are working in different parts of the United States. So, um, for the for the front for the front part of, of the creation of Borderless as a as an office as a design company that got registered for business purposes, um, I've been really fortunate to partner with other firms and. The partnership part is so important to understand because this idea that we'll have to, you'll have to navigate solo practice out there, it's probably a stretch. I think a lot of the learning comes from, from working with colleagues, from working with good mentors, from working with other um, designers and practitioners that want to take you, want to take you under their wing and, and really understand what is your interest and bringing you into projects that could be really interesting to learn from. So I had the opportunity to work in all the cities, um, some of them in the Midwest, Kansas City, um, 
Grand Rapids currently, Detroit, St. Louis, uh, all very complex, complicated histories, shifting populations. We're seeing that in almost every single city in the United States, how the shifting populations, the demographics are happening, and the need for planning processes to start including other populations. So this is the one thing that I want you to think about through a couple of projects that I selected to talk about today. This idea of principles and processes. I rarely talk about concepts in the work that I do. I talk more about what are the design principles and what is the process that we're gonna to use to translate those design principles into physical built environment. Um, so the bottom line of uh, the work that I do is very rooted in this idea of inclusive processes. And it's not that I have the handbook or the guide, the ultimate guide to do this. this. This work has been, the work that I do is um, a reflection of learning by doing and testing things and trying things and taking risks that otherwise I wouldn't have taken if I would have continued in a different architectural pathway. Uh, inclusive processes for architecture, I think there has been um, a very robust effort from different fronts, architects in different areas, um, in health and education to build inclusive process in architecture. Um, I think I'm really interested in pushing this conversation towards the idea of social infrastructure and how, what does that mean and in what places. Um, ooh, sorry, got excited. And this idea um, of public life, how does, um, communities use these moments of activating their own neighborhoods, um, their places of residence, their places of work, their places of leisure, to enjoy themselves. Ultimately, we're in the city, we work, we live, and we play, right? I think less and less we talk about this idea of enjoyment, and I think public life is a very important part of that equation. Um, so my first experience, my first formative experience, after I spent a couple of years working for um, Skidmore, Owens, St. Merrill, uh, that's the reason I moved to Chicago, um, learned a lot, really um, got a very strong structure on how to perform and deliver design services. Um, I decided to take a risk. I met the Astor Gates, uh, and love his work and wasn't really sure how that type of practice uh, will influence mine or did I have anything to contribute at all to this type of work. He's well known for his artistic practice, his planning practice, but the idea that I think was, I was really compelled about is this work called imagination. We all love to imagine, right? 